The Big Bang was, in a sense, rather simple. You can write down a rather short recipe. From that, you could, in principle, if you had a powerful enough computer, work out what would happen and end up with something rather like our universe. But could it really be that simple? Mathematics might explain how planets form, but not everything. Surely the evolution of life was still mysterious, still special. You know, people think that mathematics is complicated. Mathematics is the simple bit. It's the stuff we can understand. It's cats that are complicated. I mean, what is it in those little molecules and stuff that make up, make one cat behave differently to another, or that make a cat? You know, how do you define a cat? I have no idea. Yet in 1970, John Conway showed that even though life may be baffling in its complexity, the complexity arises from simple rules. The evidence came from a game whose results were so unpredictable that they called it life. Life had the most basic of ingredients, a board with a grid of squares filled with counters. The fate of each counter was governed by rules. Unlike our universe, there were just three. I th had this idea that if you had simple rules, um, but not too simple, <laughs> then probably things uh, would, uh, complexity would just develop. We tinkered with the rules and played around and hoped something interesting would happen. And um, eventually we settled on the particular set of rules that we did. Uh, they were sort of slightly modeled on real life. The three rules they arrived at were the equivalents of birth, death, and survival. What would happen to any particular square depended on its neighbors. An empty square with exactly three counters around it would give birth, so a new counter is added to the board. Any counter with too few neighbors would die of isolation and be removed from the board. A counter with too many neighbors would die of suffocation and also be removed and any counter with just two or three neighbors would survive, staying exactly as it was. With only these most basic rules, unpredictable and complex patterns evolved. The board seemed to produce creatures from nowhere. Creatures that crawled. Creatures that fired out smaller creatures. Pumps that looked like a primitive heart. Creatures that spewed out an endless chain of offspring. My little life game is surprising because from the simple rules, one wouldn't find, expect to find things that move in a sort of purposive manner and surprise us. That's, I suppose, why we call it life. It mimics life to that tiny extent like a little mini-universe. Science dismantled the notion of life created with a purpose. In this rational universe, there's no need for a creator. There was no design in life. Um, no design whatsoever. Um, let's start out with a blank process and sketch it. Let's get our sketch set up with the basics, first of all. Void set up. Void draw. Now, I'd say this will probably take us probably two classes to finish off, because there's quite a lot of code that we need to write, you know? And hopefully not too many new concepts, apart from the 2D array. And let's set up our size of the screen. Size 500 by 500 can go with for now, okay? All right. The first thing that we need to do is we need to make a data structure to hold our game board, all right? So the game board is going to be a two-dimensional Boolean array. So remember how we did arrays? 
boolean, open square brackets like that, um, board, all right, actually let's just allocate the board here, and let's just declare the board and we'll allocate it inside setup. To make it a two-dimensional array, in other words, something with rows and columns as opposed to just a single row, all we do is add another set of squares here like this. And now this is telling us that this array has got rows and columns. It's not just a single row of data, but it's actually, um, we'll say, this is rows and rows and rows of data now, okay? This is a two-dimensional array. Now, let's decide that we want to, what way did I do this? I did this with um, board width and board height. Yeah, okay. Let's declare a couple of other variables called board width and board height. Okay, the way I've done this, I've also got two dimensional array for cell width, or I've also got two values for cell width and cell height. Um, I think a slightly better way to do this is to just go board width equals 100 and board height equals 100. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to have a grid of 100 by 100. All right, the width is the number of uh, columns, and then the height is going to be the number of, of rows. Okay. We might declare two extra variables here called cell width and cell height. And we'll calculate these based on the width and height of the screen. Okay. That, that's enough variables to get going with. Now, inside the setup method, the first thing that we might want to do here is allocate enough memory to hold the board. And I'll show you how you allocate a two-dimensional array. So, board is going to be equals to new boolean And inside here, we put the number of rows and the number of columns. So something that is kind of confusing about two-dimensional arrays is that normally when we're specifying coordinates, we specify them as x comma y, don't we? So x being the number across, and then y being the number you go down. With two-dimensional arrays, they're actually specified in the opposite order, if you want to think about it. They're specified as number of rows and number of columns. Okay, so think about it again. Rows go from top to bottom, don't they? And then columns go from left to right. So that's the way 2D arrays work. It's row, column, as opposed to x and y. If you want to think about it in terms of x and y, it's y, x. Because right? y is going to be how many down you go, and that's the, the, the row you're talking about. And then x is the column you're talking about, which is how far across. Is that making sense to everybody? It's slightly confusing. It even confuses me from time to time. So when I'm making my 2D array here, the first thing you specify is the uh, board height. H-E-I-G-H-T, and then board width. All right, so because we're doing 100 by 100 here, it doesn't make any difference anyway, whether we do rows and columns, but we'll remember this later on when we're trying to, innate, or trying to set certain cells to be true or false. By the way, you know that this is a Boolean array, so that means each element can be either true or false. false. You're yeah, not one or zero or a number or anything. Each element in that 2D array can be true or false. So there's my board set up. Now, the cell width and the cell height is going to be the width in pixels and the height in pixels of every cell. Now, looking at the code that we have on the board there, how would we calculate that? Huh? Yeah, sure thing. How do I calculate cell width? It's going to be? Yeah, a cell width will just be the width of the screen divided by the board width. So if the board width is 100 across, the screen is 500, the width is going to be 100 into 500, so it'll be 5 pixels. Do you follow what we're calculating here? Yeah. Calculate the size of each square. It's going to be the width of the screen divided by the number of squares going across. Yeah. So cell width it's going to be equal to the width of the screen divided by the board width. And then cell height is going to be equal to the height of the screen divided by the board height. Okay. So 
Now that's our board set up, and we've allocated some memory to store our board. The first thing that we're going to do, I think, in terms of like building this little system, this game of life system, is to draw the board. So what we can do here is we can just set a few cells to be to be true, some 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 random cells to be true, and see if our board gets drawn correctly. So let's just set a few random cells to be true, okay? And this is how we assign values into the Boolean array. You just go board at the position you want, right? So let's set a couple on the zeroth row. I want to set it on the zeroth row. So the first is row, so I pass in zero, and then you pass in our not pass in as such, but use the number 5. So this is going to be row number 0 and column number 5. All right, That's what these two numbers here mean. Row 0, column 5. Is that okay with everybody? So it's just row and column, and then you go equals to true. By default, everything is uh, false. And let's just set a couple of other random ones, just so we can see to make sure our board is, is getting drawn correctly. So just set maybe 4 or 5 cells at random positions to be true. Right? Yes. Is it possible to stop the indentation when you paste in yeah, No, I don't think so. It is a pain. I don't I don't think there's any way to turn it off now, unfortunately. Um if you're using something like Visual Studio, which we'll be using next year for for um, you can right click on the code and you can reformat the code, you know? But I don't think processing does that unfortunately. So there's a few cells that I set to be true, you know? Looking at those cells there, that's 0 and 5, so that means my shapes would be something like this when I draw it. <coughs> over 0 and across 5, so that cell will be turned on. Then we've got over 1 and down 5, so that cell should be turned on. And then we've got over 2 and down 10, so that should be turned on. And then we've got over 3 and 5, so we should see if our board gets drawn correctly, that's the way it's kind of going to look like. Something like that. Is that okay with everybody? Is everyone following you know, what we're doing here so far? Yeah, yeah. So you get the rows and the columns idea. Okay. Now let's jump down to our draw method, right? Now, I'm going to write up some comments here, and I'm going to get you guys to try and write this code by yourselves, and then we'll write it together as a class, okay? So this draw method, this is going to be a nested for loop. So it's going to go row by row, and within each row it has to go column by column. So it needs to draw an entire row. An entire row consists of, if you like, columns from zero up as far as the width. You know what I mean? So we need to draw each cell. And if that cell is turned on, then we need to calculate the x and y coordinate, where that cell is going to be, and then draw a rectangle at that position. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, so let me explain again. What we're trying to do now is take this two-dimensional array and we're going to try and draw um, the two-dimensional array to the screen. Now, everywhere the cell is turned to be true, we've got to draw a rectangle. And if the cell is false, then we don't draw a rectangle. You follow? Or if you want, you can draw a rectangle in a different color. All the positives are false. Well, we've just turned some of them to be true. They start out in false, right? All right. They're all false initially. We set some of them to be true. Now, if this loop works correctly, we should end, up, should end up with a screen that looks something like this. The only way to do this is to go through that two-dimensional array row by row. So we have to iterate the two-dimensional array. Do people know what I'm getting at here? Yes. Do you want to try it yourselves first, and then I can show you how it works? Yeah. OK, how would this work if I just wanted to go through this if it was a one-dimensional array? I would just write for i equals 0, i is less than the array dot size, or the array dot length. And then I would go through that array, and then I would say, if the array element is true, then I'm going to draw a rectangle at the particular position. I need to calculate the x and y coordinate on the screen. Um, interestingly, how would I calculate the x and y coordinate? What's that? Board. Board. Yeah, so now I know this the width of each cell, and I know the height of each cell. So I take the the row multiplied by the width, and then the column multiplied by the height. 
satisfied with a byte, and that gives me the x and y coordinates. Right, look at this cell here, for example, right? The x and y coordinate, or the cell row and column for that one is going to be, that's one, one uh, that's sorry, row number one and column five. So what would be the x and y coordinates for that? The x would be five, and then the y would be? The, the y would be, sorry, yes. Hang on, that's row number one, so that means you go, oh yeah, oh, that's sorry. the y, right, this yeah, is the yeah. y value. So you take one multiplied by five to get the y, and then this is going to be five multiplied by five to get the x. Because we know the width and the height of every cell. It's just multiplication, right? So we can calculate what position that cell needs to be when we draw it on the screen. I'm going to let you have a crack at writing it yourself. You need to iterate the two loops using the four loops, okay? Or iterate the 2D array using four loops. I'm going to let you try it yourself. I'm going to stop talking. Think about it. If you don't know, ask the person beside you to explain. What we need to do is end up with the grid on the screen, which represents the 2D array. And try it yourself. And if you don't know, ask the person beside you to explain. No other way to do it apart from this, right? Watch very carefully. Watch very carefully. And there should be nothing on the screen that anybody walks out of the room and doesn't understand. Everybody should walk, uh, should understand every line of it. And if you don't understand the line of it, then take the time now to ask a question, okay? So, I will, I'll happily, happily explain. So it's a nested loop that goes through the board array, and if the element is set to be true, it draws a rectangle. So, what we need here is a loop that goes through every cell. Okay, so we have this 2D array. Let's write the first loop. The first loop is going to go and do an entire row. Now, we can figure out how to do that. Every four loops look the same. For int row, declare a variable, starts at zero. How many rows are there? <coughs> How many rows are there? Uh, four. Uh, yeah, we, we have, we have, do we have a variable? Board width is telling me how many rows there are. In fact, maybe board width, I should have actually, why don't I do the right thing here, rename this to be, um, board width is uh, calls, that's the number of columns. And then board height should be rows, the number of rows. Doesn't that make more sense? Yeah. yeah. Let's do that, because then it makes it a little bit more straightforward. You've got to see, right? Let's jump up here and fix this code as well. Instead of calling that board width, let's call that um, calls, and let's call this rows. All right? Makes more sense, yeah. Do you need to change in the I didn't use it anywhere else. I just changed it wherever I used it, which is just here, rows and columns. Yeah, sorry, you're right. When I'm allocating the array, that should be uh, calls, rows and calls. Sorry, you're correct. When I'm allocating the array, we'll allocate them, we'll call them rows and calls. Sorry, when I wrote this example up, I used board width and board height. I'm going to change that so that next year I just call them rows and calls. It makes more sense. All right, so for row equals zero, row is less than the rows variable. Semicolon row plus plus. Okay, that's gonna go through from zero up as far as the number of rows. Does everybody understand that for you? Yeah. Does that make 100% sense to everybody? Yes. Start at zero, going over as far as there are the number of at rows. Now, do you not need to go yeah. rows dot length? No, because rows is a single variable. Okay. Dot length only applies if the variable rows was an array. Okay. Right? It's just a single int. So then we can do the same thing for calls. For call equals zero, semicolon call is less than calls. Semicolon call plus plus. So I nest one for loop inside another for loop. Now what's going to happen here is, initially the value of row is going to be zero. And then for the value of row is that zero, it will run this inner loop. And it will count uh, call from zero up as far as there are columns, 100. So initially the row is zero and the column goes from zero to 100 inside this loop. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. You know how loops work, right? So this is just putting a loop inside a loop. The outer loop will run the inner loop lots of times. And then the inner loop itself runs lots of times. So now what we're doing is we're going through every cell, row by row. 
in an entire row. An entire row means we start at column zero, go over as far as there are a number of columns. Then we move on and do the next row. Where we do column zero up as far as there are the, up as far as far as there are the number of columns. Now what I suggest you do here is go something like this. Float x equals the call multiplied by a cell width. Now this is because our 2D array is going from 0 to 100, but we need to make this fit onto the screen, and the screen goes from 0 to 500. So that means every cell is of width 5 pixels. All right? So that's why we multiply by the cell width. And then we can write float y equals the row multiplied by the cell height. And then we can do rect. Ah, in fact, then we can check the value that's held in the row or column. If the board at position row and call, and that's all you need to write. You could write equals equals true, but it's not necessary because this equals equals to true is the same as this itself because it's either true or false. You know what I mean? So putting the equals equals true there is, is not necessary because it's already a boolean. So when I go equals equals true, that's like saying if it's equals to true, true is true. So we don't need to put the equals to true, but that's kind of enough to write there. Then we can write rect. In fact, let's uh, do the stroke and fill here. Uh, let's do let's do something kind of interesting here. Boom. Let's do stroke two point five here, and then we will fill. This cell with, um, what should we fill it? 0, 2.5, 2.5. So we get, that's a sort of a greeny blue color. And then we do our cell at row and column. Uh, oh no, at X and Y. And then we have cell with uh, In fact, you know what would be kind of cool to do? If I take that code out of there, it might be even better and put in an else statement here and just change the fill color now so any variation on this is fine whatever you got i just set the fill color to be zero all right let's zoom out a little bit and take a look at that code right it's maybe you know i've, I've written it out a bit more along you, you might have come up with a solution if you came up with a solution which is a bit briefer and that's completely cool as well i think this should be okay so if you look at what I'm doing here, I'm gonna you get the for loop thing, the nested for loops. Then I'm gonna check the cell at position row and column that I've just calculated for my for loop. And if that cell is set to be true, then I set my fill to be <coughs> this green color. Otherwise, I set my fill to be black. So it will draw the cell either black or it will draw a uh, cyan. And then I also put stroke 255, so it draws a border around the cell regardless of whether it's turned on or turned off. Because that way, I think. We'll get some sort of nicer looking um, board looking thing. We'll basically get this kind of grid drawn. So you can see now that the cells are not filled. The cells that don't have anything filled in it or don't have a true set to them just get drawn with the square. And the cells that have something filled in get drawn with a, a filled square like that. And you can change the colors, yeah? Colors may be not ideal, but you get the message. You get the idea. Okay. Do we want to take a small break or should we crack on? Take a small break? Okay, take a small break. I need the code up and let's take uh, five minutes. Be back at half for some more code. Okay, everybody, be quiet for a second, right? The next part of this program we're going to try and build is the bit that counts the number of cells around a cell. Now, the way to do this, of course, is to use the stuff that we, we've learned about two weeks ago to write a method. Because we're going to, you know, we, otherwise we're going to end up with our draw method is going to be really huge. And we want to try and keep our methods small, okay? Just so we can make them sort of um, modular. So, I'm going to write a method here called count live cells. And I'm going to pass in int row and int call. Okay? And we're going to write this method now, right? So, what this method is going to do is it takes the row of the column as a parameter, 
and it has to count the number of live cells around that particular cell. So let me explain how this works, right? Let me get a pen here and I'll show you. So let me bring this screen up here. For now we don't have to worry about the whole game. All we're going to worry about is this little module, or all we're going to concern ourselves with this little module which is count live cells. Count live cells. We're going to pass in the row and the column. Now, let's imagine that my board was just a 3 by 3 board. Because we can conceptualize this just as a 3 by 3 board. Now, let's imagine that this is my 3 by 3 board, and I have this cell is filled, and this cell is filled. <coughs> Okay, these are set to be true. And then I pass in for this one here, I pass in 1, 1. What's my method going to return for that? If I pass 1, 1 into that, it's going to count the number of cells around 1, 1, which are alive. So what do you think it would return? It would return 2. Okay, because this is cell number 1, 1. Sorry, 1, 1. And if you look around at cell number 1, 1, this one is turned on. This one is turned off, this one is turned on. So two is the answer, nothing else is turned on. Does everybody understand that? Okay, let's try another example here. Let's say if I passed in the cell zero, zero, what would I get? I would get zero, yeah? Because nothing else is turned on around cell zero, zero. All of its neighbors are, are off. Does everybody understand? What's that? Yeah, exactly like Minesweeper, exactly. So, what you need to do is pick a cell, say this one, right? And you're going to pass in row and column, and then you need to go through each of the uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 cells around and check to see if that cell is true. If that cell is true, you add 1 to the count. Alright? So you pass in the row and the column, go through all of the 8 cells surrounding that row and column, and if the cell is set to be true, the surrounding cell is set to be true, you add one to the count. And you do that, obviously, eight times. One for each of the surrounding cells. There's loads of ways to solve this, by the way, okay? I personally found the easiest and the most straightforward way to solve this is by writing eight if statements. Another way to do this is to write maybe another nested for loop in here, but I think the code ends up being quite complicated if you do it like that. Because you have a position here, like say, for example, if I am in this cell here, all right? And say if I pass in 0, 0. Okay? Now, say you want to calculate the, 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 the coordinates of the eight cells around. What's the coordinates of the cells at the top left of that? Minus 1, one, zero. Minus one, one, minus one, one. one. But of course, if we do minus 1, minus 1 into our Boolean array, what will we get? We'll get array index out of bounds, because the array starts at 0. Do you follow? So the first thing you need to do when you're writing your if statements is you need to check to see if the, let's just do it for the column, right? If the column is greater than zero, then it's okay to go one to the left of that column. Do you follow? Yeah. So your if statements need to be what type of if statements? Because we need to check multiple things at once in an if statement, so it's going to be? When we check more than one thing inside an if statement at the same time, what type of if statement do we call it? Double if statement. Double if statement. We call it a compound if statement because we're checking multiple things. How do we check multiple things in an if statement? And. Exactly. How do we do and? Ampersands. Okay. So we'll use ampersands. Yeah, they're or. Or, yeah. And that's not appropriate for this one because the, the, the two things have to be true. You follow? Yeah. So would you know how to write this if statement now? Write, write this method. Okay, so I'm going to put a note, couple of notes up here. First of all, we are going to write eight if statements. Um, we're going to declare a variable in here called maybe count. Okay, let's let's put this here. Declare a variable. This should be number one. Declare. which is of type integer and initially is set to be zero. We then write eight separate if statements to check each of the surrounding cells for the row and the column that's passed in. Every one of those if statements that evaluates to true, we add one to count. And then at the end, what do we do? We return count. Remember we can return values from methods? So that's one, that's two, and number three then we return count. OK? 
Okay, it's your turn. In other words, write it. Write the A gift statements. At least write the first if statement, and then I can help you with the second one or the third one. But try the first one.
for every possible value between 0 and 100. If I pass in 0, 0, uh, oh yeah, so what we do is we write eight if statements, right? Let's write the first if statement. Let's write the if statement to check to see if the cell to the top left of row and column is turned on, right? This cell to the top left of row and column, this is going to be row minus one and column minus one. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. yeah. That's row minus one and column minus one. That tells me the, the row I'm talking about and the column I'm talking about. Does everybody see that? If I was to choose this cell here, this would be row minus one and column. Yeah, just column minus zero, or column. So it's the same column as this one, isn't it? But it's one less than the row of this one. For this cell here, it's going to be row minus one and call plus one, call plus one. So in other words, if this was one, one, I would know that this is going to be zero, two. Right, because this is the row minus one and the column plus one. Same for this cell here. This is going to be row and column, yeah, column, column minus, one. minus one. This one here will be and then row plus one. column plus one. So I advance one in the, in, in the columns. This one here then is going to be one minus one. row plus one and column minus one. Minus one, yeah. yeah. So if this is going to be one one, then this would be <laughs> row plus one is going to be two, one. and column oh, minus one will be zero. All right. This is the row and the column number. This here is going to be row plus one and column, and this then will be row uh, plus one and column plus one. All right. That's how we calculate the the, the row and the column, the cell number that we're talking about. Let me just write these out as numbers, you know? Let's number all of these cells, right? This obviously is going to be row zero, column zero. This is row zero, column one. This is row zero and column two. This is row one, column zero. Row one, column one. And then row one, column two. This is going to be row uh, two, column zero. This is row two, column one. And this is row... Two. Nice. So, it's the exact same, but nevertheless, I'll explain, right? Imagine this, instead of one, one, I put in row and column here. So I can see that this is going to be the same row. So if this is row, this is also row, isn't it? Yeah. So if I have row here, I have row here. So if this is one here, I have one here. And if I have um, one here, this is going to be two. So I take whatever the column is and I add one to it. I'll tell you what, if I, um, if I, if I just apply this rule to something completely Brian, different. Yeah. If you just consider that middle square, your new zero, zero, then you yeah, have your numbers. Just sure, yeah, good idea, right? So say we should, it should change this to zero, zero. I'll tell you what, how about if I change this to 50, 50, and we just try and apply this rule to do the calculation here. Let's try that. Let's imagine this center one is 50, 50, right? So I said this is row and column minus one. So the row is 50, column minus one, 49. All right, and do you see how these kind of map up? And this is the same row, and I add one to the column. So this is the same row, 50, and I add one to the column. The column is 50, so this is 51. But well, why are we going into a minus? To go back. Yeah. Uh, I mean, why, why yeah. don't we start zero, zero, you know, sure. in, the, in, in the top uh, okay. left column? The, the, the rows and columns actually start at zero, zero. Because yeah. the center point is going to change. Yeah, it's yeah. a zero, okay. row, zero column. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I guess that's pretty yeah. good. <laughs> so where's the minus? The minus, good question, the minus. Imagine this is zero, zero. Yeah. Which it is zero, yeah. Yeah. If this is zero, zero, and I try and read this one here, then I end up with off the screen. Off the screen, or in fact, out of bounds of the array. More importantly, off the screen isn't such a big problem, but out of bounds of the array is a quite big problem. So the program will crash. If I try and read a value of minus one, and the array actually starts at zero, then the program will crash. So I'll write the first one, okay? And let's check the time. <coughs> Because there's one small video I would like to play before we finish. What time is it? Okay. Let's write one method and then we'll watch one small video and I promise it'll be worth it. Um, is there a light on that thing?
Red light. I think there is. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. So I'll just do the first one, right? Int count equals zero. So we'll do the top left. Right. First of all, we have to check to see if there is a cell at the top left. And if there is a cell at the top left, then that means that the row has to be greater than zero and the column has to be greater than zero. Because if the row is zero or the column is zero, then that means there's nothing above or nothing to the left of the cell. So if row is greater than zero and the call is greater than zero, and there's something in that cell, so in other words, the board at position row minus one and call minus one, then I add one to count. And then finally I return, okay? So that's the first one, and it's really cool. Now we're taking advantage of something rather cool that all programmers know. Watch, this is really cool, look at this. If you actually were to do this board row minus one and call minus one without all of this stuff in here, we'd get an array index out of bounds exception. But what actually happens is, it checks this part of the if statement first. And if this evaluates the false, it doesn't do any of the rest of it. It doesn't even check the rest of the things. Because we know with an and, they all have to be true, otherwise it's false. So we'll check this first of all. If this evaluates the false, it never even bothers with the rest of it. If this evaluates the false, it will never check this bit here, so we'll never get our array index and it bounds exception. So does everybody kind of understand now how we've checked the cell to the top left mm -hmm. yeah. of whatever is passed in as a parameter? And also we have eight if statements. That's the first of eight that we write. And I think it's kind of the nicest and the most easiest way to write this. Okay, it's time to finish, right? I want to finish on something because I don't want to be all negative and just say that we are all evolved and we're all just computer programs and that there's nothing magical or wonderful about life, right? So I think you can kind of move to a stage which is kind of beyond religion, maybe a new way of thinking about the world. And one of the guys who I think, there's a video which I'll share on the uh, Slack, my person called Jill Bo Taylor. Has anyone seen it? It's called uh, Stroke of Insight. Well, I'll share it. Every time I watch it, it makes me cry. And I've watched it loads of times. I think it's really, really powerful. Huh? Is that the snail thing? No. <laughs> but I will. Uh, just in case, just in case you think that uh, you know this is all about science and evolution, and that there's nothing to be just deep about. In actual fact, I think if you start thinking about this thing and you do even accept that we have evolved, it does make you feel rather special just to be alive. And one guy who expresses it really well is a guy called Alan Watts. Have you heard of Alan Watts? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well then just give this your attention for the last part of the class, right? Sideshow. If you awaken from this illusion and you understand that black implies white, self implies other, life implies death, or shall I say, death implies life, you can feel yourself not as a stranger in the world, not as something here on probation, not as something that has arrived here by fluke, but you can begin to feel your own existence as absolutely fundamental. I'm not trying to sell you on this idea in the sense of converting you to it. I want you to play with it. I want you to think of its possibilities. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just putting it forward as a possibility of life to think about. So then, let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would naturally, as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights, 
of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. Because the whole nature of the Godhead, according to this idea, is to play that he's not. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality. Not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is. And you're all that, only you're pretending you're not.